from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon and welcome to the African Middle East Division. Uh, I'm Mary Jane Deeb, Chief of the Division, and I'm happy to see you all here for this very exciting event with Kwame Dos. Today's program is the second this fall in the ongoing library series entitled Conversations with African Poets and Writers and the 25th in this unique series. In October 2011, the Africa section of the African Middle East Division, in partnership with the Poetry and Literature Center, headed by Rob Casper, and the Africa Society of the National Summit on Africa, then headed by Bernadette Paolo, and now by Patricia Bain, the, presid uh, the president, and Ambassador Pamela Bridgewater, the chairman of the society, launched a new program at the Library of Congress consisting of conversations, interviews, with established and emerging poets, short story writers, novelists, and playwrights of continental and diasporic Africa. The inspiration for that series came from an earlier program organized by the African section in November 2008 to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Chinua Achebe's classic, Things Fall Apart. So here we are in 2016 and the conversations with African poets and writers is going strong. It is well established and has brought to the library and to our patrons and readers, as well as to all those who access the library's webcasts around the world, some of the best poets and writers from Africa. The poets include Kero Petsi, Kigo Sitsil, the poet laureate of South Africa, Susan Kiguli from Uganda, Anna Mualago from Kenya, Omikongo Dibanga from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and Tijan Salah from Gambia. We've also invited award-winning writers like Amadou Kone from the Côte d'Ivoire, Egoni Barret from Nigeria, Lemon Sisse from Ethiopia, who then became the new chancellor of the University of Manchester. No connection. He was going to be the chancellor without our series, but anyway, I just wanted to mention. And last week, we hosted Shinas Patel, the first Mauritian writer in this series. There are too many to mention, but we are partnering with others to bring more of these exciting writers and poets to the awareness of the American and the international public. But before we start the program, I would like to say that we are deeply honored to have Kwame Dos with us today. He has been described as the busiest man in literature. So we are really privileged to have him here an Emmy Award-winning poet, actor, critic, musician, editor, and so much more. Let me first introduce the president and executive director of our partner organization, the Africa Society of the National Summit on Africa, Patricia Bain, who will make some remarks, after which Robert Casper, the head of the Poetry and Literature Center, who was behind inviting Kwame Dos, trying to convince him to bring him to come here, um, he will introduce um, Kwame Dos. And then Dr. Angel Batiste, Africa Area Specialist in the African section of this division, will conduct the interview. So, Patricia. Good morning again. I'm Patricia Bain, I'm president of the Africa Society um, of the National Summit on Africa, an organization that um, started out as a grassroots organization to engage Americans about what they would like to see um, and how they would like to shape U.S. Africa foreign policy. Today, the Africa Society is the premier organization that engages Americans about Africa and creates partnerships to inform about the continent's peoples, its cultures, and its contributions. And um, there's no better way to do that and than through a cultural lens because today we know what influence culture has on the perception of people. Um, so today we're excited um, for another iteration of our conversations with African poets and writers um, with the African section of the Middle East and Africa 
Division and the Poetry and Literature Center of the Library of Congress. Both of our organizations, all three of these organizations, are committed to providing a platform for African literary figures. And um, it's our privilege today to have Mr. Kwame Doze. I, um, I guess if it's acceptable to call him Ghanaian Jamaican, I, I don't know. <laughs> But um, you have a rich cultural background that is only rivaled by your prolific artistic expressions in literally everything, poetry, novels, plays, film, um, plus taking on a whole host of social and um, cultural issues. We're honored to have you today and um, I'm, we're glad that we have a good audience um, to engage in this cultural exchange. And uh, I will now ask Mr. Rob Kaspar, head of the Poetry and Literature Center. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, I was just remarking to Patricia and to Mary Jane uh, how it feels like a family gathering whenever we come together for this series. Um, it's thrilling to see the great range of writers from around the continent that we've been able to feature here. And we're thrilled and delighted to have Kwame Daz here uh, today. Uh, before we begin, let, let me ask you to turn off your cell phones or any other electronic devices that you have. That may interfere with the recording of this event. Second, uh, there's a Q&A session, and um, if you participate in the Q&A se session, um, you give us, we, we ask you give us permission for future use of this recording. We're re recording it for webcast. Um, before I tell you about uh, Kwame and this program, let me tell you a little bit about the Poetry and Literature Center. Uh, we are home to the Poet Laureate Consultant in Poetry, and we put on 30 to 40 programs like this throughout the year. If you want to find out more about us uh, and programs like this at the Library of Congress, you can visit our website, www.loc.gov slash poetry. Uh, you can also find out more about events in uh, this division, uh, in this wonderful reading room, uh, and, and look at the webcast of uh, previous conversations with African poets and writers. Uh, series events at www.loc.gov slash rr slash Ahmed. Uh, as the two previous introductors have said, we're thrilled and delighted, we're honored to have Kwame Dawes here today uh, to close out the fall conversations season. Born in Ghana in 1962, Kwame Dawes spent most of his childhood and early adult life in Jamaica. He is the author of over 30 books and his 16 collections of poetry include Progeny of Air, winner of the Ford Poetry Prize for Best First Collection in the UK, and Duppy Conqueror, New and Selected Poems, published just a few years ago by Copper Canyon Press. Dawes' novels include She's Gone and Biovac, and his nonfiction collections include A Far Cry from Plymouth Rock, A Personal Narrative, and Fugue and Other Writings. The, the editor of several anthologies, Dawes is also an actor, playwright, and producer, an accomplished storyteller and broadcaster, and the lead singer in Ujama, a reggae band. Fifteen of his plays have been produced, and in 2009, Dawes won an Emmy for LiveHopeLove.com, Live an interactive site based on his Pulitzer Center project, Hope Living and Loving with AIDS in Jamaica. Dawes' other honors include the Hurston, Legacy, Hurston Wright Legacy Award, the Poets and Writers Barnes & Noble Writers for Writers Award, and a Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship. In 2004, he received the Musgrave Silver Medal for contribution to the arts in Jamaica, and in 2008, the Elizabeth O'Neill Verner Governor's Award for service to the arts in South Carolina. In 2009, he was inducted into the South Carolina Academy of Authors. Kwame Dawes is currently the Glenna Lushai editor of Prairie Schooner and Chancellor's Professor of English at the University of Nebraska. The co-founder and programming director of the Calabash International Literary Festival, he also teaches in the Pacific MFA writing program and is on the faculty of Comic Conum. He is also the founder of the African Poetry Book Fund, which promotes and advances the development and publication of the poetic arts through its book series, contests, workshops and seminars, and through its collaboration with publishers, festivals, booking agents, colleges, universities, conferences, and all other entities that share an interest in the poetic arts of Africa. And I have to say on a personal note that we've been working on this series uh, 
the other co-sponsors and I for a many number of years, and it's so heartening to have the opportunity to bring someone who shares our commitment to and vision of what uh, literature from the continent can do for American audiences. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Kwame Das. So good afternoon. Uh, it's good to be here. Um, it's a beautiful space, and um, I thank uh, Rob for, for, for initiating this conversation that I hope will continue through uh, a series of collaborations and so on. We had a great dinner last night. Um, and it is always good to find uh, people who value language and poetry. Um, and as I've, I've always said, um, Poetry is not the answer to everything. Uh, I think people who see poetry as their religion are unfortunate. Um, but there's a time when a poem is needed. And, uh, and when it's needed, it's the only thing that's needed. And it's the only thing that will work. And I believe this sincerely, and I believe this completely. I also believe that our art is a product that generates this remarkable thing called empathy. Um, not only generates it, but it trains us in empathy. The truth is that all acts of hatred, of racism, of bigotry are predicated fundamentally on a lack of imagination and incapacity to imagine what somebody else is feeling. That's the function of empathy. Uh, it is possible to have that capacity eroded and, and in fact destroyed and ultimately stumped in people if they do not have the chance to exercise uh, this capacity for empathy. And I think in the wisdom of our millions of ancestors over, over thousands and thousands and millions of years, uh, we understood in our bodies that the way to do so is through art, through music, and through the imagination. The more we kill the imagination, the greater our capacity to hurt and damage each other. So this is my way of saying, it's good that they pay me to write poems. <laughs> I'm saving the world. <laughs> uh, I'll just read a few poems, and um, I look forward to the conversation that we'll have in a minute. You know, my story is, um, I like to think it's interesting, um, because it, it's a challenging story. Uh, I was born in Ghana, in West Africa. Um, I grew up there until I was about 10 years old, and then eventually we moved to Jamaica. So then I grew up also in Jamaica, um, and then eventually left Jamaica as a grown man uh, to study in Canada, and then I've lived in the US since 1992. Um, there's a way in which my journey and the narrative of my journey is an echo of journeys that um, those before me had made and here I talk about the Middle Passage, that journey, that, that, that forced journey that brought um, Africans to, to, to the New World. But even later than that, my own grandfather, in about the turn of the century, about 1905, 1906, um, decided to, to work, uh, to, to take on a gig with the colonial office to go to, to, to Nigeria. Um, to work there in Nigeria, and he went, he worked in southern Nigeria, in Wari, um, and, and there he littered the place with, with a bunch of children, uh, including my father, who was born actually in Nigeria. So it turns out I'm actually Nigerian, uh, which is not something I say a lot, but um, but, but when it's necessary, because you know Nigerians are very powerful people, so when it's convenient, I make the association. They're also annoying, so that's the other reason why I struggle with it. But one can say the same thing about, decidedly about Jamaicans, not Ghanaians. Ghanaians are always sweet. Um, so, <laughs> so anyway, um, that journey was interesting because in a sense, he lived in Nigeria for about, he and his family lived in Nigeria for about 15 years, almost 20 years. And then my father did the same thing, having been born in Nigeria, he lived in, Ga in Jamaica, grew up in Jamaica, uh, because when he got to Jamaica in 1928, he was just about two years old. Uh, but then he went back to Ghana, and that's how I came about, because he married my mother, who is Ghanaian, and, um, and they had children, and he also lived in Ghana for 15 years. 
Um, this idea of migrations and cross uh, that, that conversations throughout this African, Africa and its diaspora is built into my body and my life. And so my whole work is about speaking from a perspective that recognizes an entity called Africanness, uh, an entity that is Pan-African, that is global, um, that recognizes the traces and the dignity and the history of African people. Um, and yet it is comfortable in the idea of movement and in the idea of migration. And so my work is about making those connections. It's not a crisis for me. It's not a, a conflict for me. It is not a struggle to understand myself. I get, I get myself. I understand who I am. I know, as Bob Marley says, where I'm coming from. So you, you know, I wouldn't have to ask you, who the hell do I think I am? I know who I am. Um, I'm a buffalo. I'm going to start singing. <laughs> so, so my poetry reflects that. And I'll read a few poems that do that. But I want to start with a poem for Kofi Awona. Kofi Awona is, was, was, was a cousin um, related to my mother, a dear friend of my father. And when Kofi was killed in Kenya, um, uh, several years ago during that attack at the, um, the mall uh, in, in Nairobi, I was there. Uh, we were waiting for him to come and do a reading, in fact, because I had arranged for him to come to, to Story Moja because we had just published his book of poems, his, his new and selected poems. Um, so then we got the news that he could not be found. And later on that night, we found out that he had died and been killed. Um, it's a it's a painful recollection and a painful memory because part of it was the, the sort of struggle of knowing that I was, you know, I'd asked him to come to, 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 to Nairobi. Uh, but, but I took great comfort, you know, because I know the family quite well in the fact that he wanted to be there and, um, and it was a chance for me to see him again and to actually show him the cover of the book because the book hadn't been printed, but we showed him the cover of the book and he was elated and, and just felt good about it. Um, but I, so I, I like to begin my readings with a poem dedicated to him. This is a little small poem, uh, not a poem dedicated, a poem that he wrote. This is a small poem called Counting the Years, and um, it's by Kofi Awona. As usual in the earlier dreams, I come to the whistling shores, the voice of the high-domed crab still, but a chorus remains of the water creatures of earlier times, of the birth time and the dying time, the pity when we resurrect the travelers, the anchor man on our singular boat that will take us home. There's a poem called Acceptance. After Acceptance is a poem for my father. Then I read the monumental legend of her love and grasp her wrinkled hands. There's a quote from one of his poems. You are a child there from two to introverted ten, crafting your dreams from tattered books, teacher doors crammed into his shelves. Your brother was a knight and your sister's princesses, and you write verse because you longed for friends. Curled in the cool underpart of the creaking house on the hill, you battled chickens for space to sketch the worlds in your head. We drove there together once, you proud of the recollection, stared endeared each sharp bend in the road with names like breadfruit curve, star apple corner, and tambourine arch. Your laughter was nervous, nearing the house, the child in you drumming a rhythm on the sweat slick steering wheel. On the slack porch, you pointed through breadfruit leaves to the faded line of sea and sky where Cuba wavered in the midday haze. From there, as a child, you learned of otherness, worlds beyond the house afloat in a sea of green from there, your home became a point from which to leap. I walked the overgrown paths where, fired with Arthurian legends, you galloped mad child on a wild irreverent steed, dizzy in the patchwork of sunlight through the branches. The thought of you as child is real as the trees towering and staring upwards, I trace your steps, avoiding the trunks by the pattern of leaves in the sky. The child overwhelms my straight back logic and suddenly I'm sprinting, beating hoof beats against my chest, light blazing green on my face, my shouts echoed in the tree trunks. 
On the barbecue, dry brown pimento beans roast. The ancient chair she sat in is there where a rotting orange tree leans and sheds brittle leaves. The chair is light and fading, sucked dry by sun and salt wind. I can see her bandana there, sharp calico against the hills, gray, her wrinkled hands outstretched, trembling, her eyes glowing. Maybe your ghosts hover above the house at night, but I came at daytime. So I'm not sure, but teachers, you taught me much in the lesson of your silent ways. While there, I smell ink. I smelled ink and the dust sneezed is chalk dust. Your world was a noble one, you cloud of holy witnesses who sought new worlds to replace the chain link silences. Daily Bible verses etched on your brow missionary zeal and gave strength to your upright eyes. Now you hover above this house that crumbles where the wood takes termites. Maybe grand ones, your ghosts linger above the house, meeting there, then together swoop down one wind, lifting a tattered sheet's edge, one animation, now a brilliant O, oh, cooling with a breath the sheen of toil on some weary back, shifting breadfruit leaves to a rustling as eyes turn upward, smiling at the cool, not at you, not knowing that ghosts are wind. You return morose, having done your part of touching the living before dawn and getting little thanks for it. You return to your tombs in which you were sheltered from the swelter of sun and the tramping of my feet now in the gray and green. I praise the dream of Sturge Town and the silent homecoming it was. I praise the songs of the ghosts sealed in my mind's chrysalis. I praise the constant leaves spinning in the pure air. I praise the hands that birthed you, worn as they were, for they glowed stained red with first blood spilled into this navel string where for years the ancient red bark trees have stood. I praise these things freed by your wrinkled hands. I'll read two more poems. That should do the trick. Um, this is a poem called African Postman. Some years ago, um, I was invited by the BBC to write a piece about Haile Selassie uh, to do a documentary. It's actually for radio, for BBC Four. Uh, and the idea was that I would do a documentary about his period in exile in Bath, England. So I was going to go to Bath and I guess talk to some people at Bath and so on. And then I thought, well, I should go to Ethiopia. I mean, I mean, what's, how do you, what's the point? And, you know, BBC was paying. So I convinced them to, to, to pay for me to go to Ethiopia. And I did. And it was one of the most beautiful and powerful times I got to talk to all kinds of people who knew him. Um, and this is a poem called African Postman. Uh, it's dedicated to a man called Solomon Ephraim Wolf. I met him. He was a Jamaican living in Sheshamani. That you know, 500 acres of land that Selassie had ceded over uh, to anybody from the diaspora who wanted to go back to Ethiopia or go back to Africa to live. And Solomon Rolf was a Jamaican who was one of those rastas that decided to take him up on it. And I asked him some questions and then came the most troubling question, which was my question to him was, how did it feel when Haile Selassie died? Which is not a question you ask a Rastafarian. So, African Postman. Son, who is that? Is the African Postman daddy? Burning spear. East from Addis Ababa, then south deep into the Rift Valley, I can hear the horns trumpeting over the flat-roofed acacia trees. See the African women bend low with wood heavy on their backs and the cows, goats, donkeys, mules, sheep, and horses snapped into obedient herds by sprinting children moving along the roadside. Life happens here. I'm traveling to the land I have heard about, Sheshimani, the green place, 500 acres of jazz benevolence, and I know now that I long to hear the rootsman tell me how, despite rumors of his passing, the Nati keeps on riding, keeps on standing in the fields of praise to hold on to the faith of roots people. Brother Solomon, you put the name Ephraim on your head and carry the face of the true Rasta, the face of an Ashanti warrior, eyes deep under heavy lids and your skin tight as leather blacker than black. 
I've met you before on the streets of Kingston there where you trod to the hiss and slander of the heathen. You, Natty Dread, gathering the people's broken minds into your calabash. You carry it all, tell them, return to the roots, the healing shall take place. You are burning Spears' voice in the fields of Tef. You tell me of the prophecy of Marcus, and I listen to you through the phlegm, through the gruff of your voice, and suddenly, when I ask you about the passing of the emperor, you rise up like a staff of correction, your voice reaching back to the mountains, your warrior self, your yardman greatness, and you speak a mystery of those who have ears but won't hear, and those who have eyes and won't see, and I know that this dread will one day stand in this soil and find his feet growing roots that soon the earth will be darker for the arrival of Solomon. Oh, let the heathen rage, let the doubters scoff, let this Ghanaian youth whose eyes have seen the face of Jesus Christ, let him too sit and marvel at the faith of the Nati, for this African postman has forsaken father and mother and has come to stand before his imperial majesty to call only him father so that the father might call him son, and the world will carry on its weary march, and the eye Ibises will swoop in the Ethiopian dusk, and the smoke will rise from wood fires, and the night will come with the news that the rootsman, after 400 years of being told he is homeless, has come home. Yes, Jah has come home. Sons and daughters of his imperial majesty, Haile Selassie, earth rightful ruler, without any apology say, this is the time when I and I and I and I should come home. Yes, Jah. O come a hold the foe. Na le go. Na le go. Na le go. Okay, so I'll end with a poem called Rope. I was happy to see when I went to the African American Museum yesterday that. Um, you know, I was nervous going in because I said, I went to the theater section and I said, if they don't feature Ntasaki Shanji and August Wilson, I'm burning the place down. <laughs> and I was happy to see that they recognized. So those two are featured. August Wilson is the center of a new collection of poems that comes out this year from me, next year from me, called City of Bones, A Testament. And this poem called Rope is a response to August Wilson's work. Some of the work I've done, the academic work, the scholarly work, is to talk about August Wilson's engagement in African aesthetics, um, the idea of diaspora aesthetics, but particularly African aesthetics in his work. But his poems, his, his plays are remarkable, uh, just an amazing thing. So this poem is called Rope. I usually read the last few lines of the poem first, and then I'll come back and start again. So this is how the poem ends. Someday a soul will come out of the fields to claim it, and then we will know. Someday a soul will come out of the fields to claim it, and then we will know. To hold our lives together on the cart before the slow march after midnight along back roads, blind driving, the scent of the exhaust making us drowsy. Every shadow in the fields a threat of sorts. We use rope thick as two thumbs side by side, pulling hard on the knot to keep our parts from falling by the wayside. We have kept this rope supple with oil, constant use, never letting it stay idle long enough to rot. It is hard to look at the coiled silence of our strongest rope and not think of what it has held. The heavy gray-green battered bucket knocking the stone sides of the wall, top water spilling back down this cherished substance carrying our lives. The mare white and gray plodding across the, the wide open field at dusk, her head heavy with labor, the rope a caress against her cheek, the way she turns towards a gentle tug. We hold the balance of our need in this rope, the dead weight of June bug at, now, at dawn, his skin still steaming his beautiful black skin catching the morning light tender among the leaves, how we found him there, his neck stretched, the wrapping of several yards of taut rope around the drooping branch, where we found it, how we undid the knot, let his body down into our arms, then carried it like a soldier's flag, bearing it behind the cart, shaking along with his swollen body, 
this ordinary robe, this gift we cannot forget, this remembrance of what we have lost. Someday, a soul will come out of the fields to claim it, and then we will know. Thank you. Thank you. Kwame, I have a few questions. A few questions, good. Yet each question has many parts. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like to start with asking, uh, you wear many hats, mm -hmm. actor, writer, scholar, mm -hmm. musician. Mm -hmm. How did you come into writing? Ha, <sighs> so, and, and these days I've been sort of rehearsing, I, I've obviously answered this question before and I realize sometimes I lie in my answers <laughs> um, and then the lie becomes sort of rigid in, as truth. Um, we see a lot of that. Um, so these days I'm, I've been forced to re-examine my answers to these questions so that I can speak some truth in all of this. Uh, it turns out, though, that you know, writing is a funny thing. There are two parts to it. One is the motivation to, to do it, to actually do the writing. The other part is to feel permission to do it, the, the, the sense that it's okay to do it. And I think some of the struggles that most writers who are beginning to write have is asking themselves, do I have a right to do this? Or do I have, is it in part, is it, does it make sense? Uh, wise and, and concerned family members will say, what? And they, they mean it, and they are not wrong. This may not necessarily be the, most, the, the easiest way to eat uh, on a regular basis. So, so there are those two questions. Um, and the other question is, is it, is it in the realm of possibility as a kind of reality? So for the first one, I think it's safe for me to say that I wrote and I write uh, because I read. So, 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 so the, the, the business of reading gave me pleasure. And for some, at some point, I became interested in replicating that sensation. And I discovered that the pleasures of reading can be replicated somehow in writing. Um, they're not equivalent, but they are similar. So, so, so we grew up in Ghana, and my father was notoriously uh, against television in the 60s. So we didn't have a television. People did, but we didn't, and he was adamant about that. I just think he didn't want to buy a TV, but he, <laughs> he had wonderful philosophical reasons for, for not buying, you know, it's Mar you know, he was a Marxist, so it's capitalist, and it's just, it will addle your brain and things like that. So, but what he did do is that he said, you can buy any book you want, and I, I, don't, I won't quarrel with that. And, and so, and this meant comics even, like, you know, Marvel comics, anything that you read, he said, that's fine. So we just bought comics. <laughs> and he paid for it. That's great. No, but, but, but so we did, we realized that our entertainment would have to be through reading, and so that's what it was. Um, and I think soon we as kids, there were five of us growing up, and I think we as kids began to, if we run out of books to read, we began to play around at writing these books. We were not precocious little bright kids. We just, you know, we, you, know you go, you bully some kids, you beat them up, and then you come home, you don't have anything to do, you don't have a book to read, you say, hey, let's make up some stories. So it's just that, we were, that's what we did. Now, this doesn't mean all my family does. My, my family, does. I'm the only one who is a writer. So, so that's, that, I think, but that sense that I could replicate the sensation and the pleasures of reading through writing started fairly early. And the only other thing that I think continues to be relevant to my impulse to writing is that when I was about 11, 12, maybe about 13, I discovered this thing called pen pals. And, and in those days, there were these little teen magazines that would come. And in those teen magazines, at the back of them, people from all over the world would put their names and their addresses and you could just write a letter to them and you know you wait three well you wait a month really maybe a month and a half <laughs> if it's not email and it will come back right with a with a response mm -hmm. and i began to do a lot of pen pal writing and i became kind of drawn to it because 
I think it's hard for people who are younger to understand that in a world in which there is no internet, there is no Googling of information, I could become very quickly, at least for the people I was writing to, the premier authority on everything, not just me, but everything Jamaican. To be honest with you, I, I, gain, I gain authority because if I said I like Aki and saltfish, they couldn't Google Aki and saltfish. So, so if I said Aki tastes like, you know, like ice cream, they just had to take my word for it. <laughs> Do you understand what I mean? But I, was, I became enamored of this process and I wasn't trying to, to fake it. I was trying to, I found it exciting that I, I could bring somebody into my world and describe my world. But I also was seduced by the fact that in these letters, I became a protagonist. That the I had power, that I had a way to manage narrative and manage experience. So if I got beat up by somebody, even in the retelling of it, even though I was the one beat up, I became the heroic figure in that narrative. And this, this I found deeply seductive and very attractive. And I, I can't say that that impulse of writing for the pleasure of making words happen for me, and then writing with the knowledge that somebody else is reading it, and writing with the sense that they will return back to me a response to it has ever changed. I think that desire, that, that, that sensation, still remains at the heart of literally everything that I do as pertaining to writing, uh, to, the, to the arts, to literature, and so on. So, 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 so that's a sort of broader picture. The step-by-step -step processes would be a, a different thing. But I think that that's where the impulse came from and has continued um, until then. So, so, so I'm not the guy who says, I write for myself. I'm not that guy. I don't understand that guy. <laughs> I, just, I think that guy is lying, frankly. <laughs> so. okay. I'd like to go into your work, um, Natural Mysticism. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the work, you construct the concept, um, the reggae aesthetic. Mm -hmm. What is the reggae aesthetic, and how has that influenced your writings, your work? Yeah, so, so at some point, you know, here's an interesting story. Just recently, I've been looking at diaries I wrote in my 20s, and this is, this is, this is one of the beauties of me saying, I make up stories and think they are true. Because when you read your diary, you kind of get the facts straightened out after, you know, it's been 30 years since I've read some of them. Well, I always thought that I started to think about writing critically about reggae when I was a, a graduate student in, 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 the, in New Brunswick, which would have been in the late 80s, 87, 88, 89. Um, and that this was something that I just had started to do then. Well, I, read a, I was reading a diary from 1982, and in it, I had found some music, some reggae music, and again, you have to understand at the time, if you didn't have the record or the tape, you, you didn't have the music. You, you, you had to get the actual thing. And somebody had given me a whole bunch of Bob Marley tapes. Even though I grew up listening to Bob Marley, there were songs I didn't know that he had done, which predated me. And I started to, and I wrote about it in the diary. I, I started to do this analysis of the lyrics and so on. And then I said, one of these days, I'm going to write a book about Bob Marley. This is, this is, this is what I wrote in 1982, just you know, that comment. And the book, Bob Marley, Lyrical Genius, which came out in, 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 in the 2000s, came from that initial impulse, which struck me as quite shocking that I was thinking in those lines. But part of the reason is that when I started to think about writing and when I started to think of myself as a writer, I wanted to understand a kind of aesthetic that resisted the, the, the inclination towards a kind of slavish uh, dependence on Western ideologies and Western literature and Western culture. And a number of voices began to help me to do that. And one was, um, was Amir Baraka talking about blues people. The other was um, Kalamu Yasalam, who's written brilliantly about the blues. And the other, of course, was Langston Hughes writing about the blues in the Negro Artists and Racial Mountain. I became fascinated with their, try, their attempt to create a vernacular for, for black poetics. And I thought, this is, this, is, this is confidence building, because one of the 
the things that damages you sometimes as a writer is when you start asking yourself, who am I and who are my people and where am I from? And I mean that in a literary sense. So I thought, this is attractive and this is interesting. Then I watched Kamal Brathwaite, who is the great Caribbean poet, invoke jazz as a functioning kind of aesthetic. And I realized that he wasn't entirely happy with that invocation because it was borrowing something from African-American culture, which he felt OK with. But he was also wrestling to see what in the Caribbean would speak to him. So he began to develop this idea of a kind of um, a jazz aesthetic, which I found very interesting. And I started to read up on jazz. And I thought, this is cool. You know, you have a, a kind of folk aesthetic, a kind of populist aesthetic that you can then create a poetics out of it. And then I read Nicolas Guillen using sun music in Cuba to, to, to try and e explain the sort of Afrocentric nature of his poetics and so on. And then, of course, I started to look at Yeats, and I thought, Yeats is interesting. And I realized there's a whole period of Yeats's work, which is anti-British. By the way, it's just the British that we had a problem with. <laughs> Nobody else, because it's such a big influence. You know, Derek Walcott divided and Zayn and all that. So, so, so it's, a big, it's a big and lasting influence. And I found those things exciting. So then I started to ask myself, what is the space, what is the, 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 the aesthetic and e emotional space that I'm growing up in? And, and I realized that reggae music and all that it meant in the late 60s and early 70s was defining who I was. And in fact, I began to see in poets like Lorna Goodison, Mervyn Morris, all these Jamaican poets, a clear sense in which they were being influenced by reggae without admitting it, without even saying, this is what has happened. So that brought me into this scholarly idea that I want to investigate whether there is such a thing that one could construct as a reggae aesthetic through the Aristotelian approach of saying, let me look at the text and see if I can see in the text those aesthetic lines that, 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 that make sense. And it began to, to hold together very well for me. And so the book, uh, Natural Mysticism, became a way in which I began to look at whether, in fact, this phenomenon of reggae music with its antecedents being um, you know, uh, Kumina and all of these Afrocentric um, music styles was in fact shaping a poetic in, in the Caribbean. And then I realized it was also shaping my own poetics. So, so the reggae aesthetic is not prescriptive, it's descriptive. It's actually saying this is what has happened and I'm very interested in seeing how it evolves and then recognizing those elements in myself. But even as it's descriptive, it's also incredibly confidence and endowing. It makes you feel like you are coming from a credible space that comes out of this wonderful uh, complexity of cultures mixing and creating something, as Kamal Brathwaite says, torn and new. So Africa makes sense in the Caribbean, Africa makes sense in, in, in South Carolina, in the Gullah people and so on. All of that begins to make sense and works within this musical form called reggae. In, 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 very, in very complex ways. So I could, this is one topic I could go on and on forever about, because of course, um, it, it does go on and on forever, yeah. I'd, I'd like to ask one question yeah. in terms of this concept. Mm -hmm. um, is this an extension or does it extend into the Pan-African aesthetic or is there a Pan-African Yeah, it's aesthetic? absolutely an extension. So one of, the, one of the interesting things that I've been very fascinated about is, um, for instance, Rastafarianism. Rastafarianism started really, we, we dated to 1938, right? 1936, 37, 38. We can actually tell when this new religion started. But the thing is, so, so we talk about Rasta as this new religion that just starts. And Rasta's fundamental premise is that it looks to Africa. It, 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 it's, it presumes a, an important line shared, given to it by, by gestures by somebody like Haile Selassie. Haile Selassie comes in and says, you know, he takes the title conquering lion of the tribe of Judah, takes the title that in, the, in, the, in sort of the narrative, mythic narrative that he comes from the tribe of David, he comes from the queen of Sheba and so on. And Rastas then say, okay, here's this, this is interesting. So we then see Haile Selassie as the return Messiah. So the Rastas then construct a, a, a kind of belief system around that. But it's a radical political belief system because what it's doing is it's that it's proposing that God is black. This is problematic for other people. But, we, so, but the question then becomes, well, why are you panicking? I thought you said God does, it doesn't matter, race doesn't matter. 
But when suddenly God, the return Messiah, is black and kind of hanging out in Ethiopia, this complicates the conversation, right? Um, and it, it, it's not madness at all. It's actually a profoundly reasonable argument that proposes a discourse that says those who have shown the capacity to resist colonialism, resist Babylon, resist the oppression of African people, look attractive and make sense ideologically as a part of a, as a, part of a functioning belief system. So, so Rasta emerges as this entity, and there's a long story about how it develops. But the, sometimes the mistake we make is that Rasta just fell down out of the sky. But if you look at the, the, the antecedents of Rasta, just think of the simple Negro spiritual, go down Moses, way down in Egypt land, tell old Pharaoh, let my people go. Built into that, that narrative, that song, is a reconstruction of Christianity. Because Moses is claiming to be the, the black people. He, the, the black people are the children of Israel. They are the chosen people, which makes the white people not. <laughs> which is a radical, which is a radical kind of um, thinking. And, and, and that radical kind of thinking is a, is a creative invention that is there for resistance, as a way to resist, and a way to bring a moral authority on the actions of those who claim to have a kind of control and authority over that action. And, and I think there is a way in which, and the truth is, Jamaica's uh, resistance movements, the, the Moran Bay Rebellion and so on, all were influenced by Baptists, and those Baptists were formed in the early 1800s by African-American ex-slaves who escaped and moved to Jamaica and started the Baptist, Baptist movement in Jamaica. So this Rasta movement comes out, this, this Africa is all the way through, this notion that they're African Americans and so on and so forth, this is a myth. So, 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 so f for me, that long narrative begins to make sense in that, in, in that, in that cyclical, cyclical, way, cyclical way. And so re reggae aesthetic does have an antecedent. It has an antecedent um, that, that, that connects with other movements that are trying to reclaim a cultural identity and a cultural sensibility, both politically, ideologically, spiritually, in language, and all these kinds of things. And, and, and I'm not even a Rasta. <laughs> do, do you understand? But I, I own that. I, 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 it's part of um, my understanding of it. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, let's go on uh, and talk a bit about your new series. Yeah. Um, new Generation African Poets, mm -hmm. which you edit with Chris Abani. Mm -hmm. uh, you're featuring eight uh, new emerging uh, African poets yeah. in this series. Well, the series is an interesting project. It's a proposal that, that, we, that I came up with about three years ago. And the proposal was that for 10 years, for 10 years, we will publish eight to 10 chapbooks of African poets, new generation, poets who have not been published in book form before. Um, and we'll do that once a year. So we are now, next year we bring out the fourth one. So we do one every year. So we started one uh, three years ago. And so far we've been doing it steadily. These are these. So this is the first one. This was a, this one had seven, right? Okay, good. That, you can see them, the covers. And this is the third one, or the second one. And I think we had, um, I can't count. This is probably eight in this one. And then um, more recently, We did this one. So this, this is another eight. So this is the one that you're referring to. And then next year is, is going to have 10 poets. So it's going to vary in, in, that, in that sense. But these are new writers who haven't been published. And we do a chapbook for each, each one of them each year. Um, and the idea is that in 10 years' time, we would have published 90 to 100 new poets from Africa. Mm -hmm. um, of the first set, that is the first box set, the first and second box set, all but a couple of those poets have already either have contracts for a full-length book or they have full-length books already published as a result of the att attention that these, these works got. Essentially, we decided to use this mechanism to start changing the landscape of publishing for African poets and to make sure that African poets could be published. 
Um, and this sounds like a lot, but Africa is a big place. <laughs> you understand me? It's a big continent. To do eight a year is like scratching the surface. I mean, it's, it, we're, barely, we're barely scratching the surface. Is there a reason that you chose the chapbook format? Yeah, so we, we, we've decided to approach this on a multi-pronged way. So we're doing chapbooks, but we're also doing a, a series called, the, a classic series by major African poets who have been published already and so on and so forth, who, who do not have a collected poems or a major new and selected poems. And so we started with Kofi Awuna's book, um, uh, and, and that was a, a, a collected <coughs> poem. And then we followed that up with um, Gabriel Okala from, from Nigeria, uh, a major, one of the, the first major poets from Africa who is still living. And so we've done a, a, a collected poems of his. And then we are bringing out next year Amata Edu's uh, collected poems. Amata Edu published two collections of poems, but had written multiple collections of poems that were never published. So we did the work to pull that together, and so her book comes out next year. And then each year we'll be, and then the following year, Kia Pizza, who has been here before, we'll be publishing his new and selected. So that's one series that we do one a year. And then we have a book, a book prize for the first book prize, a full length book prize for African poets called the Silliman Book Prize, and we publish that volume. And then we have an Over the Transom series where poets who may have published before the you know, established poets can send manuscripts in and we will you know, publish it. We'll arrange for them to be published and so on. So it's a multi-pronged uh, publishing sort of effort. Even though we, when I say we publish it, what we do is we broker the publication of these books. Okay. Yeah. Now with this new generation of uh, African poets, what are some of the themes, subjects? Yeah, so, so I think what, we, what I've tried to do, they, they, you know, I'm, a, I'm an academic and a, and a scholar, and, and my training is that way. And so my inclination is to do that, is to say, this is what is going on, let me write a book about that, and so on and so forth. But I've had to sort of resist that as an editor, to even think about it in those terms, because I want the work to emerge and then to start speaking itself. But of course, for each of the box sets, we have to write an introduction. So when I come to write the introduction, I start to see themes. One of the most striking themes that I'm seeing, first of all, the next box set, of the 10 poets, nine are women. This is, this is, this is, this is, this is, what, this is what has happened. And, and in my introduction, the introduction that Chris and I wrote, we kept re returning to this idea of the body, the female body, the African woman's body, the way that the body is read, the way that the body is, 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 is resistant, the way that that body is trying to understand itself in a, in, a, in, a, in a changing world. And keep in mind that these are poets from all different countries in Africa. Some are in the diaspora. Some are living in Sweden. Some are living in Britain. Some are living here in America. So they, you see the influence of migration. You see the influence of, of a global sensibility, the, 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 the communication that the internet has created. You see the influence of them reading works from different places and so on. But what is consistent all the way through is that they self-identify as African bodies that are trying to, to negotiate what that means in a, in a global landscape. I think that, that is a consistent theme that, that we see running through these works. The cover illustration on mm -hmm. all of these books are absolutely beautiful. Yeah, you know the story behind these, right? So what we decided to do for every box set, we get one artist, we get a major African artist, and we ask them to supply art for each one of the covers. So it's a single artist for each of these, each of these box sets. So this is a wonderful Nigerian artist who, so all the covers are from his artwork. Um, we have a lot of Nigerian artists. The first one is a Nigerian artist. Um, and then this year, um, I, um, Fikre, you know, Elizabeth Alexander's husband, late husband, who is a, a, from, from Somalia, um, Eritrea originally, he, he's, they, she, she gave us his work. So that is featured on the cover and so on. So we try to create a gallery of African art for the covers. And um, I just think that's cool. <laughs> I, I don't know about you, but I think that's really cool. <laughs> right? And they give it to us free. We don't have to pay for it. That's the generosity. I mean, we, we should pay, but we, we can't afford to pay for it. So they, yeah. Um, my next question, um, and it might be a bit repetitive. That's okay. Um, but in terms of, as editor of the African Poetry Book Fund, um, what is really the history of the organization? Mm -hmm. 
What are some of the long-term <coughs> goals of the organization? Yeah, so the, the African Poetry Book Fund begins through a series of circumstances that, that, um, that have to do with recognizing a, an absence, a gap, and thinking that something has to be done about it. Uh, Chris Abani and I were, in, um, were touring in Africa for the, uh, it's a, there's, there's a um, Poetry, Af Poetry Africa is a wonderful festival um, that happens every year. And they brought us there to tour Southern Africa. So we were visiting a few places. And we were struck by a couple of things. One is there were so many wonderful poets who were performing and doing good work, but they had an opportunity to publish. We also saw a lot of work that needed mentoring, needed editing, needed some clear care attention, and they were not getting it. And we started to make relationships with poets to meet them, talk to them about it, and to talk about opportunities. Many of them were publishing but didn't know where to, 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 to send works to journals and things like that. They were rightly concerned that if they sent it to American journals, they would just be dismissed and, and not understood and so on. So we started to talk to them about that. So then eventually in our conversations, we thought, why don't we find a way to, to start publishing these works um, and, and, to, and to arrange to publish these works. Now, I have a history of creating opportunities for the publication of work um, in South Carolina. Uh, for many years, the University of South Carolina Press decided not to publish poetry again after starting the James Dickey series. Uh, which didn't go well, um, and so they decided against it. So I approached them, and I wanted to start. I started an organization called the, the South Carolina Poetry Initiative to 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 do to publish work and to promote the work of poetry in South Carolina for everybody. And I approached them, and I said, "Why don't you guys start publishing poetry? Because you know we we we've got some good poets here." And they said, "No, it's just a bad idea. It's dangerous, and so on. Nobody buys poetry, and so on." So then I sought funding. I looked for money. And I said, look, I'll give you the money to subvent the cost of publication so you don't lose any money. So that excuse goes out the window. <laughs> and they said, well, we don't know where we'll find the poets. I said, well, we'll find them. And then they said, well, we don't have a poetry editor. And I said, I will edit it. Yeah. And, and we'll get it edited. And then we'll work with you and we'll publish these books and so on. Now, there is such a thing called the Palmetto Poetry Series in South Carolina that is still going strong. And that's how it started. And we no longer have to pay them anything because they've taken it on as a, as a methodology. But it took several years of them publishing these books for it to be to sealed in. Well, essentially, that's the model that we, we used. Talking to, we went to many pe people, many publishers, and we were fortunate when Laura Silliman, um, the, the wonderful um, uh, uh, woman decided to support the African Poetry Book Fund by giving us just the money that we needed to help subvent the cost of publication of these books. And that's how we made arrangements with first Slappering Hall Press and then later on with University of Nebraska Press and of course Akashic Books and, and a few other places that we're talking to. And we do acquisition, we do editing, we do the mentoring of the writers, we create a wonderful network. So it's not just our decision, and it's a team of people, about eight of us, who are incredible poets, uh, Habiba Badarun from South Africa, um, Philippa de Villiers from South Africa, um, John Keane, an African-American poet, um, Aracelas Gourmet, uh, an American, African-American poet from uh, East Africa background, um, Bernadine Evaristo, who is uh, Nigerian heritage, lives in England, a wonderful poet, Chris Abani, of course, and Matthew Shinoda, um, this is the team, and these are all people who have volunteered their time and their life to mentor writers, work with writers, and help us acquire it. So we have a network all around the world. I, every year we say, send us the name of poets that you think should get mm -hmm. some attention. We approach the poets and we say, send us the work. So for each of these chapbooks, we get about 40 submissions. We ask, we, we, we request 40 submissions. And then we select the ones that we think are the strongest ones. And we continue to work with those that we don't select. So it's a, it's a big, major kind of effort. But the product is, in four years, we've published over 40 poets, right. African poets. Okay. Now, you're also editor with Prairie Schooner. Yes. So can you discuss that a bit? Yes. So Prairie Schooner is, a, is, a, is, a, is, I don't know if you know this, but it's probably one of the oldest. It's the third oldest literary journal in this country. Right? Paris Kuna began uh, in the early 20s. It's been going for 90 years. Um, and I joined, I became the editor about five years ago. Um, uh, 
Before that, it had been run by Hilda Raz, the amazing Hilda Raz, who had run it for about 30 years. I think they, they've, I'm the fifth editor of this journal, so it's, it's, it's one of these. Uh, and, and they never, st this is 90 years of continued <coughs> publication, a quarterly. This is remarkable because depression, wars, whatever, they've been publishing steadily. Um, so becoming the editor of Prairie Schooner was very exciting, but of course when I came in, Prairie Schooner had one, Prairie Schooner made the hugest difference in terms of women poets, women writers in the 80s and 90s. Hilda Raz uh, was a great advocate and made space for women writing, women's writing, where very often most of the other journals, which were run by dudes, were not doing that kind of work. And some of our great poets today, who we know by name, had a lot of their beginnings with, with, with Prairie Schooner. But when I came in, I thought, well, okay, we'll continue that wonderful work, and that has continued, and we have a wonderful uh, uh, record in that regard. But I wanted to make it more international and to extend the international weight of the journal. And, and that's what we've done. So in a, in a few years, the journal has a, a great international reach. Uh, but we continue to publish this journal every year. And also, the good news is that um, Prairie Schooner gives me a platform to do this kind of work, whether it's work here, whether it's in England, in the Caribbean, um, with, with writers. Uh, for some useful reasons, people want to publish in a journal, so they're nice to you um, when, when you talk to them. So Paris Kona is, my, is, is a calling card for me, and I, 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 I don't apologize. It's, a, it's, a, it's, um, it's been very helpful, yeah. Working with both, working with um, the African Poetry Fund mm -hmm. and Prairie Schooner, mm -hmm. Schooner. Mm -hmm. um, how do you see African poetry and American poetry? Is there a contrast? Uh, are there comparisons? Uh, is there something that can be lent to each other? Um, I think that's a good question, but you know, here's the problem. I think, th th I have to say that there's a profound compromise that I'm doing when I say things like African poetry. It, it, because in a sense, that's a bit of a misnomer. It's a convenience. It's a convenience because, because of colonialism. It's a convenience because we totalize Africa as if it's one place. And, and, and we do it because it's the only way people will understand. If I said it's Nigerian poetry with a population of almost 200 million people, people will say, well, that's a little parochial. Do you understand what I mean? So, so there's a way in which we have to speak in a language that, that people will understand to get, to get the thing done. So comparing African poetry with American poetry is a bit wonky. Be, the reason I say that is American poetry is more homogenous, even though it's complex and varied. But if you think about all the, the thousands of language groups in Africa, all the different tribes in Africa, all the different literal nations in Africa, to collect them as one thing and say one thing about it is, is I think this is, it's actually misleading and, and intellectually problematic. Which is why when people ask me, let's talk about African poetry, I'm resistant of sort of making broad generalizations because I think, I think it perpetuates this myth that African poetry is one thing or looks like one thing. In the very same way that, frankly, if you were honest and somebody said, tell us about American poetry, you would go, I don't know what the heck you're talking about. Like, how, how, do, you, how do you put somebody, um, Billy Collins, behind Amir Baraka? I mean, what, 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 what connects them? And all we do is run to Walt Whitman and Emily Dickinson and say, that's the route, and that's all we can do. Do you understand? And everybody does this as if this is the only answer to that question. So that's, uh, that's, that's one kind of the answer. But the other part of the answer is, is to say that America has grown and its poetry has grown and blossomed because of its openness to poetry from other parts of the world. And that openness has come through publication and through translation and through uh, communication. And that's why us doing this with African poetry enriches American poetry. It gives America access to the poetics of a place that it has ignored for so long, sometimes 
not willfully because there's just not enough books for them to look at to see what the connections are and to create a conversation. So, so indeed, I think it enriches uh, the, the American, because it challenges American poetry. It challenges American poetry about what is, what is poetry. Is poetry um, about simply you know, you know, talking about flowers and, and plants, or can poetry be um, about, about uh, politics or about spirits and so on and so forth? Whatever it is that is brought into that conversation, I think, enriches that conversation. And I think the good news about America is that American poetry has been open to those conversations. And, and we don't want those doors to shut. And so we want to ensure that that conversation continues and that, becomes, that we become a place in which the world's poetry can be articulated and spoken. Now, I might be saying that just because I'm here in America, because probably if I was in England, I would say the British tradition has been very open. <laughs> no, but I think it's true. I think it's uniquely true about America. I, I don't think that's an invention at all. I thank you. Uh, Kwame, I thank you for this conversation. Thank you for these questions. Okay. Good. Um, I think at this point we can have our Q&A. Okay. Anyone? We're just going to open it up for questions here, so I'll turn around to you, and um, if you have a question, or may want to answer. Kwame, thank you so much. I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I wish we could stay longer and talk <laughs> some more. It was so enjoyable. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a quirky question. <laughs> Is it okay, then, to say conversations with African poets in that way? Yeah. <laughs> If it's, if it's okay to say it? Yes, I think it's okay to say it. Yeah, and, and I mean, as long as we recognize, you know, we always should put before sort of a kind of preface to say, to say that, we, you know, because you could say, um, we could say English poets, we could say poets writing in English, we could, we could do totalizing things as long as we recognize that behind that is, is great variety and, 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 great, and great, as long as we're conscious of that and we keep saying it's not a country, it's a continent. It's not a country, it's a country. But absolutely, I think it's fair to say that. And also, let's not, be, let's not make any mistake about it. The fact of colonialism has, brought, has made these countries connected to each other, whether they wanted to or not. And therefore, it's part of the narrative history. And, and we should recognize that and value that. In other words, you can't talk about Latin America without understanding um, Simon de Bolivar. And, and that has made Latin America a thing which it, nece it wasn't necessarily so until that political vision of, of, of Simon de Bolivar. So, so, so I think it's fair to say that, but also to recognize the distinctions and the differences, yeah. And we have tried, we have tried to be also uh, specific about each country, each region. Absolutely, and if you and don't, if you don't, they will tell you, what about <laughs> us? <Yeah. laughs> Why do you have so many Nigerians? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I just have a quick question about language, and particularly with regards to African languages yes. and publication of things in the original language. Yes. What sort of initiatives are you doing, perhaps, or are being done to preserve language and to promulgate poetry in the original language? Yes. Yeah, so, so we are doing nothing in terms of we are doing nothing directly to promulgate. Uh, uh, writing in the original languages and publication in the original languages. But what we are trying to do is to, we, one of the things that we've talked about uh, as a really important philosophical question is that is the question of how does a language survive? And the language survives, weirdly enough, through the process of translation. Translation actually allows a language to survive because if the culture produces uh, a work, I mean, this is something that um, I think um, uh, Ngugi Wathiongo was always arguing.